Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to 3D Vision Technologies 104 Tech Talk, a monthly introduction to engineering technology that can make your company better, faster, and smarter. I'm Todd Majewski, your host for today. Today's topic is getting to metal parts without the cost of a metal printer. Our guest speaker is Jeremy Marvin, application engineer for 3D Vision Technologies. Jeremy works out of our Cincinnati office and has worked for 3D Vision for almost five years. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thanks, Todd. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that's listening that the show is being recorded and we'll send out an email with a link to go back to this presentation and you can view it in its entirety or share it with any of your friends. Also, we'll be answering questions at the end of this 30-minute presentation, so use the chat window to type in your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait to the end to type in your questions. We'll summarize them all. Uh, so, Jeremy, before we get started, let me ask you two questions that everyone might be thinking. First one is, who is this presentation geared towards, and why should the audience listen? So, I think this presentation is going to be geared towards somebody that has some hands-on experience with FDM, you know, used depth position modeling from Stratasys. Uh, maybe not the beginning user, but an intermediate that kind of knows that there's some design tricks involved with that. And maybe you've gone to some trade shows, checking out the metal scene, seeing where they're at, uh, maybe getting some numbers for pricing, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, so this presentation is really not geared towards somebody who knows nothing about 3D printing. They should have at least a general understanding of printing and some of the technologies that are out there yeah. today. Yeah, a general, a general understanding because uh, we're not going to get too deep into... FDM, uh, I've got one or two slides, but that's it. Just, okay. Just quick little notes. All right, great. Well, let's get started so our audience can learn how they can try and make metal printers or metal parts <laughs> without a metal printer. Okay. So uh, just a, a quick agenda for today's presentation. Uh, I want to go do an overview of DMLS, uh, one of the, the metal technologies that are out there right now. We'll go into what it is, uh, and then we'll go through the uh, the cost associated with that, and actually a customer story of how somebody benefit, benefited from that process. Uh, I want to do a, a couple slides on FDM, fused deposition modeling, uh, show you some basics of that, and, and then we'll take that, what we know now in FDM, and take it to the next level by uh, applying metal. Sure. So uh, DMLS was kind of one of the original metal printing uh, technologies out there. Uh, I was thinking it was started by the government, maybe NASA, maybe the military and then handed off to uh, one of the manufacturers that are still around today. Uh, DMLS is Direct Metal Laser Centering. So that name has stuck to the process, even though that we're not centering the metal anymore, we're actually melting it from one layer onto the next. Uh, this little graphic here on the left, you can kind of see uh, these little, little dots representing the dot droplets of metal. So the little uh, metal powder, the, the granules are about 40 microns in diameter. Uh, I've heard that that's kind of the sweet spot where we want to be for metal printing. Uh, you, the machine lays out a, a thin layer of this metal powder, a laser melts it together into whatever shape, and then the, the, it comes back and it'll lay another layer down over and over again. Now, something that I've learned least recently is I always thought that that metal or that powder bed was the support structure for the metal, and it's not. You know, as the, as the metal part grows, it gets heavier, the powder settles a little bit, we actually need to create a support structure underneath it to hold that up. Um, DLMLS is really uh, geared towards really complex metal parts, something that you couldn't uh, manufacture anyway with traditional. Uh, would be kind of the sweet spot. Uh, low to uh, mid volume for production parts, uh, maybe some parts with those cavities that I mentioned, some weird undercuts or draft angles that we couldn't, uh, we don't have a bit for, uh, or maybe where some part consolidation is needed. You know, taking you know a multi-part assembly and, and taking that down to one piece. Uh, so some some frequently asked questions is uh, you know how how fine is the finish on it? Well, they they'll come off the machine off the raw machine with a surface finish of 350 RA. So that's the roughness average, which would be kind of in the ballpark of uh, a traditionally cast part. Uh, the part printed should be just about as strong and have some physical properties similar to that. Now, I did find a number, a number on the porosity of a metal part, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but I found a number of 99.5% dense. Uh, to me, I would want to see it higher or even up to 100%, but I'm not a metal, metallurgist, so I don't know if that's good or not. 
Um, so up on the screen, I have uh, a metal part on the left. On the right, I actually have parts that were metal printed, and they're on the build tray. So we're, we're laying out that powder bed, we're lasering it, it's melting to the build tray. Any of those support structures, and hopefully you guys can all see my mouse here, this is the support structure for this overhang here. All right, so once we get this, this parts done, we clean off all that powder, uh, which to me sounds kind of messy. Uh, we need to clean out all that support structure after we remove it from the build tray. And it's actually centered or melted melted to that build tray. It's melted to that build tray. It is stuck on there good. Uh, I don't think there's an issue with parts lifting off on metal printing. All right. So uh, we need some extra equipment to go along with our, our metal printer. To remove it from the build tray, most people use a wire EDM machine. And then to remove the support structure, we're talking about uh, CNC equipment and a lot of special hand tools. Uh, maybe if you're in if, if you're into manufacturing, you have the CNC equipment, and maybe you already have some of these things. Uh, here I've got a picture of a guy with a little uh, pneumatic sander uh, polishing it up, and then uh, another bracket, a metal printed bracket, where you know this would be really really difficult to manufacture traditionally, uh, and to reduce the weight. Um, and any special surface finish. And so we talked about right off the machine that we've got a, an RA of 30, 350. If you want it better than that or that's not good enough, you're, you're putting in a CNC machine anyways to finish it off. Okay. So let's go through the cost quickly here. Uh, so uh, I surprised my boss when I went out and got a quote for a metal printer. Uh, his eyes lit up like huge. So we looked at a printer of a 25 by 25 centimeters by 32 and a half. So this is roughly you know, 10 by 10 by you know, something. Uh, and our quote came back around $700,000. And um, depending on the options, if you want all the bells and whistles, that could drop down in the low 600s, all the way up to a million dollars if you wanted to take it up to uh, one of the higher end levels. Um, so we needed some facilities requirements, some facility, facility modifications. We need uh, to print on the, the fine, fine powder metal. It's, it's dangerous stuff to work with. You need an inert environment, so you need a nitrogen or argon inside the chamber, and that's a consumable. That's something you're replacing every month. Uh, so we got a quote of about $200 a month for argon service, and uh, let's see here, uh, $10,000 for electrical work. So we're not equipped to even install one just yet. You know, we have existing service, but to get it up and going, we needed about $10,000 more. A wire EDM machine. Uh, we've got a quote on that about $165,000, and uh, the price increases with those as your vertical height increases. So uh, we got a quote on one with a 250 millimeter vertical height, which in re all reality isn't going to be big enough for our machine that we were looking at. Uh, parts coming out of the oven need to be uh, annealed and heat treated to get their full mechanical properties. So a small heat treat furnace, we're looking around $8,000. Uh, after we wire ADM the parts off the build tray, we're going to need a grinder, a surface grinder, to get that plate back flat. You know, we might get lucky and get a few uses out of it. Uh, a CNC machine to clean out all those support structures and maybe clean up areas that require that. Uh, and then there was a huge range of CNC equipment. The lowest that I found was about 150, and uh, so we use that for my final figure and up to 500,000. But if you're a machine shop, you already have a lot of that. You can knock that cost out. Uh, a blasting cabinet for some other, uh, maybe bead blasting to maybe help remove the support structure, or maybe you want to polish up the surface a little bit more. Uh, so the consumables, that's uh, $10,000 for the blasting cabinet. Uh, $200 in consumables every month for that. And then uh, we needed an air compressor, which I didn't realize they required shop air. So I'm learning as I'm doing the PowerPoint slides is a, we needed a 10 to 15 horsepower compressor for shop air, and our quote on that was 15 grand. Uh, full protective wear, the full protective wear is mandatory. Uh, the the fine particles, if it gets in your lungs, it's not coming back out. Uh, Unsidered metal is dangerous and very very flammable. So it sounds like if you are if you're not a current machine shop and you don't have any of this equipment, um, you're, you're looking at quite a bit of money. Exactly. It's, it's quite a bit, you know, a guy in his garage is going to be pretty metal at home. All right. Uh, and then there's some skills required for the, to set up the part builds and to run the equipment. It isn't uh, just to use the software involved with that. Uh, I was quoted a week or two to go to, I, I think, the company's out of Michigan that, that trains the, 
all the equipment manufacturers are using the same software. It's called um, Magix to, to do that, materialize. So they do all the support structures and all that. Uh, and then they have a pretty high power consumption for that laser and the amount of heat required inside of the build envelope. And then all that secondary uh, safety features built in the machine. You know, I went around and I poked uh, the brains of all the manufacturers at a trade show and nobody's had an incident where oxygen got into the environment and ignited it. Nobody's had that yet. And so they've got a lot of safety built in, so we've got a good track record as far as uh, additive manufacturing in general. Um, a consumable cost. Uh, we've got quotes from $100 up to $550 uh, per kilogram. So about 200, or I'm sorry, 2.2 pounds uh, for about $550. So that's everything from aluminum, uh, stainless steel, and to a couple different grades of stainless steel, some tool steel, and canal, and uh, titanium are some of the, the big hitters. So uh, somebody has a calculator and added that all up for me. Uh, if you were starting from scratch, you didn't have anything, you'd be looking at $1.1 million just to get that machine. For the DLMS technology. That DMLS technology for that 10 by 10 by 32.5 millimeters, that, that smallish bill envelope as far yeah. as what I, I consider. And then, you know, the consumables for the, the CNC machine, the, the, the blasting cabinet, and all that other ancillary stuff that you need consumables for that, $2,400 a month in argon, all that stuff. It adds up. So just to turn the machine on, $2,400 a month plus the initial investment to get the parts. Got it. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a lot of money, and I don't want to turn people off to that because there is fits for additive metal. Uh, it's, it's been around for a long time, and there's a, a good story right here in Cincinnati of the, the GE fuel nozzle. This story is out there everywhere. So uh, it's a very, very complex part. Uh, they may have gotten away with uh, maybe doing some sort of casting of this, but it wasn't. It was an assembly. So this new part is 25% lighter, 500% stronger than the traditionally manufactured part. Uh, reduced the part count. So the old part was 18 uh, conventionally manufactured parts, and they were all brazed together. Well, wow, that's a process brazing uh, right there. I've ruined some parts trying it out myself at uh, a previous job. Uh, each each engine, so this, this nozzle goes into the new Leap engine that we've heard a lot about in the news. Each engine requires 19 of these nozzles, and every aircraft requires multiple engines, so you can see how this all adds up. It actually saves them $300 million on average per aircraft Three million. Three million. Yes. Wow. And the source here. And uh, look over on the side. I'll have a link to that article if you guys want to check it out. Uh, the story is all over the place, so you might have already run into it. Uh, so uh, FDM in brief, uh, you need a design. You need that CAD file just like we do for the metal side. You get your CAD file. Uh, you've done your testing on it. You know it's good. You send it to the printer. Uh, from there, we're going to choose the material. So uh, starting on the lower right, moving up, we have some ABSs. And as we go up, the tensile strength, the impact rating, and the heat HDT, the heat deflection temperature, increases as we go up. So uh, at the top, we have uh, the Altums and PPSFs, and then we go down from there. But the, the process we're going to discuss here in a little bit can be done to almost all of these. And uh, I have another giveaway to you guys. It's the spec sheet for... Uh, the Stratasys printers, the Stratasys FDM printers, it should be popping up at some point over on the right-hand side. Uh, if not, I'm sorry. We'll send it out later on as well. Okay. So uh, FDM in general, we're taking that, that material that we just chose, the Altum or polycarbonate or ABS, whatever it tends to be. We're going to feed that filament through the printer. We're going to heat it up. We're going to extrude it through a nozzle onto a build plate. Uh, layer by layer, very similarly to the metal printer, we're going to draw a cross section and we're going to drop the Z stage down and we're going to keep drawing until we get our part built or grow the part as some people are saying. Uh, and again, any overhang will do a support structure and that's generated automatically by the software that runs the FDM equipment. So some examples of FDM parts, uh, I have this engine block, I believe this is what we call a surrogate part or maybe a prototype. So a surrogate part is used to send through a production line. So maybe at Ford or GM, they're sending these plastic parts to the production line. If they crash a robot, they're breaking the plastic part. They're not crashing into a, an actual metal part. Uh, aerospace, uh, I've seen a lot of duct work in aerospace for cooling components and you know what, what have you. Something that you would be very, very difficult to machine. 
So this is all plastics. Maybe some low volume part production, some simple parts, and then tooling. This is the uh, fiber layup tool for some um, uh, product packaging. And we also have, you know, sand casting that we could talk about and we'll, we'll discuss some other things here in a little bit. So uh, I wanted to focus on uh, a little bit on the Alta material here at the top, um, 9085 and 1010, and specifically their tensile strength. So 9085 and 1010 are kind of two of our, our most uh, endured, uh, the highest rated, the, the, the highest tensile strength, the highest HET, all that stuff is in these two materials that we have available to us in the plastics world, the thermoplastics. Uh, we, they range from 72 to 81 megapascals or 10.4 to 11.7 thousand PSI. Okay, so keep those numbers in mind. Uh, so if you guys are following us on our tech talks, uh, last year we did a tech talk on a couple tooling and one of my favorite uh, applications is actually soluble core. Uh, so our sacrificial core. So I print out a tool in a, in a soluble material and we wrap it with carbon fiber, we autoclave it, and then later on we dissolve that out after the epoxy setup. And uh, when it's done, we have a part that matches our tool that we made. Okay. Well, what we wanted to do is we did this, we printed that a, a similar part or a part that would be really hard to manufacture if we're going to create a form. Uh, this part was printed uh, in SR30, so to get in the SR30 range, with, as far as soluble goes, um, we could start out on a Fortis 250. So it's the same envelope that we were talking about for that the metal printer. Um, we've sanded it down. We're going to spray it. We're going to coat it with some sort of conductive coating. So uh, there's conductive epoxies, conductive paints, and then we're going to apply our electrodes to it. And we're actually going to send it through a plating process. So we've got anything that can be conductive can be plated. Uh, so in this case, we, we plated this with 12 thou of ductile nickel. And then once the part was plated, it took about a day and a couple hours to plate this. Uh, we put it into our, our normal cleaning station, and we dissolve that material away. So here we have one example of a metal part from uh, a 3D printed FDM a plastic part. So this is the, the rabbit out of the hat here. So you're taking a plastic part and then plating it, is that correct? Yep, plating it. And then you're adding uh, the thickness. What's typically the thickness you can get out of that? Uh, I've seen, uh, so it's 10 thou build up a day, so if you want to wait two days, you have 20 thou, three days, you have 30 thou. Um, I, I know that the more you add, the stronger the part's going to be. So it depends on your application, what you need it to be. So there's a complex part there, but there's probably many applications that you can uh, build from, right? Exactly. Yep. So uh, some of the uh, ratings of the, uh, the material. So at the bottom, we have the range for printed plastics, so 5 to 12,000 PSI. If we, uh, the raw nickel, right, not, not the printed part, plated part, it's the raw nickel is uh, 20, 226,000 PSI as far as tensile strength goes. Uh, we don't get all of that when we plate a part. We get some of that, but it's, it's surprising how much. So you guys remember this chart where we're talking about 9085, the PSI, the tensile strength in PSI was 10,400. And we sent that out for testing after plating it. And here we have a chart. Uh, this purple line I want you to look at right here. Uh, hopefully my cursor is coming through. And that's uh, nickel, nickel plated and polished. And if you follow that across, we're above 300, uh, I'm sorry, 300 megapascal. You convert that, that's 43,500 PSI. And I saw these numbers and I'm like, I'm pumped. I'm like, that is awesome. And that, that's 400% increase in tensile strength over our printed part. So uh, talking to the manufacturer, he allowed me to use some of his parts, uh, some of his pictures, uh, some brackets, you know, brackets that you can lighten up, you can add holes, you can put the strength where you need to using all those tricks that we talked about in FDM. And but, but those parts aren't plated, they're, they're plated, right? Yeah. But the, the plastic is still underneath it. The plastic is still underneath it. So uh, we talked about dissolving it out. This is actually leaving that part in there as, as, as a place to hold out the metal. And it, it functions like a, uh, a composite. So think about a bridge with like rebar reinforcements on it. The, the rebar couldn't span it by itself. The cement couldn't span it by itself. But you add those two together and it becomes super strong. Excellent. 
And, and here they took out a lot of the weight, reducing weight. You know, I've heard a, a story where they take off one magazine off an airplane and it saves them, you know, hundreds of dollars a year. So any, any weight we can reduce in aerospace is going to be huge. Uh, so I found this part, this story right here, and uh, up in the upper left-hand corner. So we kind of go around clockwise. We got our CAD model. We sent it to the FDM printer. Now, this structure right here, we can build without support. So it's super easy to print this structure out and remove it. There is no support to remove because it's all self-supporting, that angle which we, we learned about. Uh, and we plated it. So the core is still in it. And then we can uh, bond that to carbon fiber face sheets. So what you use that for? Uh, something in NASA? Yeah, something where weight, like maybe is sending it to the space shuttle, the space station, where weight is is imperative. You, know, you have to reduce the weight, reduce the fuel cost, reduce the overall launch weight. You know, I just thought it was a cool picture and a, and a good story, a good use of this process. Okay. So some conclusions that we could draw from this. Metal plated FDM parts, that it really bridges the gap between our thermoplastic printer and a metal based additive manufacturing equipment. So it's a part, it's a bridge. It's going to be way stronger than the, the plastic part, but going to get us into close to the strengths of the metal printed part. Uh, it's very cost effective. Uh, we haven't really talked about costing yet, but uh, in general, generally speaking, if you were to uh, buy a part, a printed part from a service bureau at $500, it's going to cost you $500 to plate it. So it roughly doubles your price. Which, well, which is still cost effective comparable to printing entirely in metal. And exactly. Yeah. And if you don't need the, the solid metal price, maybe, maybe 40,000 PSI is good for you for the tensile strength of your application. So it's perfect. You know, it sounds like the, our customers who are listening would really have to call, either call you and say, hey, I got this application. Will can we plate this part? Will this work? And how would we design that to get to uh, the strength requirements that we need? Yep. Yeah, so we can definitely look at that. Uh, so I, I got, we have a lot of experience in, in designing for FDM, for additive, and we can use those same tricks. We don't need to worry about the metal tricks yet. Yeah. We're going to worry about the tricks that we learned with our thermoplastics, and uh, I can help you with that. Got it. So uh, the pricing is going to be closer to the FDM systems, but getting uh, you know pretty close to the performance of the metal. And uh, do I have one more? Uh, we can optimize the design. We talked about doing that. Uh, the process material parameters uh, are going to have a substantial cost. So the metal powder is what we say five hundred fifty dollars up to five hundred fifty dollars for two pounds of the stuff. Right. Yeah, so I noticed that in the poll, we found there was a, a, a good portion of our customers listening already had FDM technology. So really, it's just a matter of, okay, let me take my existing FDM machine, I'll print it apart, and 3D Vision, can you help us get it coded? Now, 3D Vision doesn't have the plating process. We have our <laughs> vendors that we deal with. Yeah, right? we have our vendors, and we'll, we'll definitely help you get there. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so uh, I guess that's about the end of our presentation. I'm looking over at... Yeah, let's open it up to some questions. And uh, we've got a few coming in. So one of the questions, uh, they I just saw how much does it cost, and I think you said if the part costs $500 to print in FDM, you can probably double that. So a typical part would be about $1,000 if it's 500 bucks to make in FDM technology. And FDM technology, okay, yes. So then, that kind of covers that. And then you could either do that with a soluble material. So you 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 do a soluble material and you dissolve that out later on. So if you're coating it and making a wall thickness, yeah, right, you can do that. Or it. or you're leaving it in there as a as that composite material. Uh, I see another question. It's like, can you plate do plating on um, polyjet? parts because we always talked we're talked here mostly about FDM so Jeremy what about if somebody owns a polyjet printer uh, yeah I have seen some polyjet parts uh, I, I focus on FDM mainly because you could dissolve off the FDM material if you needed to to get to a, a, a solid metal part uh, polyjet we don't have a soluble material that's going to go through the plating process the the support structure is water soluble but there's going to be nothing left of it when you put it in that plating Got so I, I chose to focus on FDM but you can plate the polyjet Parts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can take the, the straight up Vero White, the, the regular rigid material, and you can plate it. You can get several thou uh, build up on it. The same exact way. You can basically plate anything you can make conductive. 
And as long as you've got the coatings. Yep. All right, here's a real good question. Uh, is the process of printing an FDM and plating quicker, which is good, than DLMS printing and post-processing? So great, great question. So, so which is faster? Which is faster? Uh, so I didn't really get any uh, costs or times associated with building in DMLS. So uh, I know that our machines can build apart in some time. Uh, it's going to be hard for us to judge without knowing, okay, here's a part. Let's print it in metal on a DLMS technology. And how long does it take to do the whole post processing? Now let's take that same part and let's go ahead and plate it. Now you're going to have some pros and cons, but we don't have the atom, or we don't have the uh, the answer for that one. So apologize for that, but we certainly can give you samples of how long it would take. And uh, we have room. We have time for one more question. And uh, Jeremy, why don't you take that one? Uh, so the question is, what kind of strength gains are you seeing with printed polyjet materials? Uh, we, I did not find any numbers uh, for polyjet. I wasn't looking for them, but I can reach out to our, our vendor that we're working with and see what his, uh, what his results have been. Uh, I know that they're still tweaking that. Uh, it isn't kind of set in stone yet. The process for FDM, they've got pretty well licked. But for polyjet, they're still kind of tweaking it and dialing it in. All right, so we've got good history on the FDM, but not polyjet, so we can get some data at least on the on the FDM. Well, that's it for our questions. I want to thank everybody for attending uh, our 104 Tech Talk, and I hope you're able to see how you can um, utilize uh, FDM-based technology to make some metal parts. So join us next month for our upcoming 104 Tech Talk in January on improving performance for SolidWorks. And if you have any more questions, please contact us at 3dvision.com. Um, and uh, sign up for our next 104 Tech Talk. Thank you very much and have a productive day.